Hello, welcome to the show tonight, Lessons of Vietnam. We have uh, uh, two very special guests tonight. Uh, these gentlemen uh, have got quite a story to tell you, and we're going to tell you a little bit about uh, the organization they're a member of. Uh, we have Jesse Torres, who I've known for quite a few years, and uh, George Ox, who I've known for uh, a few years here. And what we're going to be talking about tonight, uh, basically, we're going to talk a little bit about their story, but we're going to be talking about the Military Order of the Purple Heart. Uh, I invite you to uh, call in at 919-518-9773 to uh, make a comment or ask questions tonight. Or if you want to go on the computer, go to Computers2K, K is in Kilo, Voice on Skype. That's Computers2K Voice on Skype. Or, or log in through the chat. Or log in on the chat, put your name in uh, and log in on the chat and ask questions. Uh, I want you to ask, call in and ask a lot of questions tonight. Uh, see if you can st uh, stump the guest, if you'd like. Uh, we'll ask him a hard question and so forth. And our first guest up tonight is uh, George Ox. George, where, where are you from? Well, I was born in Denver, Colorado. And uh, my dad was in the Army, so I've uh, really lived all over the, all over the world. Uh, did you uh, volunteer uh, or you or you uh, drafted? Well, I... Uh, I graduated from the uh, ROTC program at the University of Richmond in Richmond, Virginia, and uh, uh, was commissioned in 1965. 1965? Yes, sir. Uh, and where did you go after we got your commission? What well, you, I, 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 you, you had, junior officers had to go to all kinds of training and experience. I volunteered to go to Vietnam while I was in the basic course at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, uh, but because of the schooling that I had to attend, the uh, qualification courses and the uh, uh, parachute training and ranger school and jungle operation school. Uh, I uh, And then I had to serve at least four months, I think it was four months or six months, in a unit. So I really didn't get to Vietnam until January of 1967. January 67. Then you probably just about just missed Tet then. No, I was, I was uh, the beneficiary of attending Tet in 1967 and then again in 1968 because I extended my tour of oh, duty. Oh, okay. So uh, I have uh, two two tets to go through. Two tets, okay. Uh, I went through one. That was enough for me. I went to 61, 68. Uh, what did you do over there, and who were you assigned with? Well, I was assigned to the 1st Brigade of the 101st Airborne Division, and I was a field artillery officer at the 2nd Battalion, 320th Field Artillery. And my jobs in, uh, began as being a forward observer, and I was a forward observer with A Company, 2nd Battalion, 327th Airborne Infantry. Okay. Um, and and following a... a I, a, a tour as a forward observer. Junior officers then became uh, battery officers. So I was a fire direction officer and then later an executive officer in cannon batteries of the 320th Field Artillery. Okay, George. Some of the, pe some of the people uh, later will be watching the show on archives, uh, students and so forth. Tell us what a forward observer does. Forward observers are the eyes of the field artillery. And they are the forward. They are the fire support coordinators for the infantry company commander. I was the advisor to the company commander on indirect fires, both uh, uh, the, the the field artillery as well as aerially delivered fires. We didn't have a forward observer. Or we didn't have a fire. Uh, let's see. It was a, called a FAC, a forward air controller. At the company level, they were pretty much at the battalion level, but uh, I served as to advise the company commander for uh, matters, all matters pertaining to indirect fires, uh, other than the organic indirect fires that the infantry company commander controlled on his own, his own organic mortars. Okay, so you went out with the infantry guys to, uh, and you were standing right close by the. Uh, the unit commander with his radio and so forth also. Absolutely. I was in the hip pocket of the uh, the company commander, and we were part of the uh, company command group 
the uh, company commander and his two radio telephone operators, myself and my radio telephone operator, uh, the company medic, sometimes the first sergeant, and uh, interpreters, that kind of stuff. That was the kind of the command group of, of uh, the rifle company in uh, the 1st Brigade of the 101st. Well, all those radio operators with antennas, they must have been good targets. Absolutely. <laughs> they were uh, kind of stood uh, out. Prime targets. You, you yeah. didn't want to put your long antenna up unless you had to. Okay. Now, we're in Vietnam. Were you, what was your area of operation? We, were you in I Corps, II Corps, III Corps, IV Corps? We, we were principally in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Corps. Okay. I Corps, II Corps, and III Corps. So you all we, covered a pretty good area. Yeah, absolutely. We were, uh, the, the 1st Brigade of the 101st was called uh, General Westmoreland's Fire Brigade. We would go wherever there was difficulty and wherever the, uh, the need required. We would deploy on a moment's notice by uh, Chinook, Huey, C-130s, C, uh, C-7s, the, the, the caribou, and we even transited from, uh, from uh, Tuiwa to Duck Fo on LSTs LST, when we okay. went up to uh, uh, i the first time in 1967. Now, LST is the is the flat boat that goes up and down like they used to land on the beaches. Yes, the large slow target is what the <laughs> acronym stands for, and the LSTs uh, it would carry uh, uh, a whole battalion of soldiers and uh, could land uh, over the beach, carrying uh, all the equipment and uh, materials that are needed. And uh, those boats went up and down the Mekong, I guess, where the, where the vegetation grew right up to the water. And uh, so it was, it, and it got pretty narrow through there from time to time, I would imagine. Yes, I never got down to the Mekong Delta. We were in three corps only around Saigon. In fact, we were at, Tui, we were at uh, Tonsonut Air Base uh, for Tet of 68, uh, shooting artillery fire off of the end of Tonsonut Air Base uh, mm -hmm. in support of. Uh, an, an airborne infantry battalion that was a task force that was airlifted down there as a result of Ted of 68. Yeah. Well, George, uh, just so our audience would know how important your job was, uh, you're out there with the infantry guys and you're calling in artillery, and it's, and it's a little bit late to go, oops, I made a mistake, uh, once the artillery starts. Well, that's right, and uh, to that end, what we would do, would we had to gain the trust of the supported unit uh, by demonstrating our proficiency as, at both map reading, uh, communications, being able to, to do our job, and then uh, we would practice uh, when we would stop for the evening uh, and, and create a night logger position, we would shoot in what we call defensive targets, Delta Tangos, and we would actually fire these in uh, in addition to planning them we would actually shoot some targets in uh, just to be sure that we were exactly oriented and everybody knew exactly where they were and, and where, the, uh, where the fires would be delivered to. Yeah, because we always, we always hear stories about friendly fire, and it's not very friendly when it's uh, and coming on your place, is it? That's right. All right. Uh, so you spent time uh, in the, out in the jungles and, and, and out in the boonies with the with the bad guys, and then uh, did you later uh, go back in? Uh, or I know you were wounded. Uh, what what was the uh, what was the episode going on? You were wounded, and how were you wounded? What? Well, the first time I was wounded was uh, was uh, October of 1967. I was the uh, fire direction officer in uh, in one of our gun batteries. I think it was Bravo Battery at that time, and. Uh, I was uh, hit in the back with a ricochet rifle bullet that was fired that hit a water trailer that I was hiding underneath. But the reason I was hiding underneath a water trailer was because the I was guiding in a helicopter at night. He was delivering a resupply of ammunition to us, and uh, I had a flashlight with a red filter, and my radio operator was talking to the pilot, and I was using hand and arm signals to direct the pilot. And uh, when he got to 50 feet above my position, he turned on his landing light, 
creating a wonderful target. And so I dove underneath a water trailer and a bullet hit the water trailer, uh, fractured and struck me in the back. Uh, and that was not a significant wound, but it was, a, it was a wound that produced blood. And so for that reason, I was eligible to be awarded the Purple Heart Medal. Now, did you stay on site to evacuate you out? I was able to be treated in the field and stayed with the unit. That was not a significant wound uh, at that time. Did you have a prayer meeting with the uh, a pilot? We, uh, we, we didn't discuss it <laughs> with him uh, because I couldn't identify him. But uh, if I could have, I would have. All right, now, where did you, what were you doing? Uh, obviously, you were wounded more than once. What you were doing? Well, the, the, uh, after, after the first year that I spent in Vietnam, uh, I, was, uh, I chose to extend my tour. Mm -hmm. And after my extension leave, I was assigned as the uh, liaison officer, now called the fire support officer, to the 1st Battalion, 327th Airborne Infantry. And there I was the advisor, the company level. I was a captain at this time. I was, uh, I was assigned to be the advisor to the infantry battalion commander and would plan artillery fire, the preparation fires, we called them, uh, before we would uh, conduct an air assault. Uh, I would advise him on all matters pertaining to direct and indirect fires, um, and that was, uh, that was my job for a, quite a while. I was, uh, that was a very enjoyable assignment and I thoroughly enjoyed being a fire support officer. Now, did you have much contact with the, uh, uh, South Vietnamese military? No, we, we operated pretty much independently, uh, uh, as a, uh, as a brigade task force. Oftentimes, uh, we would, uh, we would be, uh, deployed in support, we, we would have a habitual relationship of a particular artillery battery with a particular infantry battalion. And we operated uh, pretty much independently, and we had very little contact with, uh, with uh, uh, South Vietnamese forces uh, other than interpreters, their mm -hmm. only really involvement. Well, if you were at Tonsonuk to doing uh, the Tet Offensive of 68, uh, you probably knew a little bit more what was going on. Where I was, uh, all we knew there was something going on that, uh, uh, that was getting everybody excited, but uh, we didn't, they didn't tell us nothing. Well, the, 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 what, what happened was we were at, located in, when I returned from my uh, extension leave, the brigade was, at, was in Song Bay, and I was on duty in the Brigade Tactical Operations Center at about 11 o'clock at night at the beginning of Tet of 68. And there was a radio message came in from Comus MACV, Commanding General of the U.S. Uh, Military Advisory Command, that said, I want you, the Brigade Commander of the 101st, to deploy one Airborne Infantry Task Force uh, to Tonsonut Air Base. And uh, the C-130s are going to begin arriving at Tonsonut at 4 o'clock in the morning. So it was five hours' notice to deploy a, 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 an airborne infantry battalion and an ar a supporting artillery battery. As it happened, the battery commander for Charlie Battery, which was located at the, to the brigade talk at that time, was on leave. And so I was appointed to be the... Uh, the interim battery commander, and we uh, got on the airplane and carried high explosive ammunition in handheld arm loads, and we rolled the howitzers into the into the 130s, and we went down to Tonsonut and started shooting off of the end of the airstrip. You know, uh, just so uh, again for uh, viewers and so forth, uh, getting a battalion up and moving that means you got to have food. Uh, logistics for getting there, uh, people are on leave, all these things that you got to put together in five hours, make sure I got enough ammunition and food. It's not like it's all laying around. That's exactly uh, right. But the, uh, the beauty of it was, was because we had been used to deploying on these short notices, 
It's like being in the in the uh, 82nd Airborne Division today. They have responsibility to deploy on very short notice. Mm -hmm. So we had the uh, the capability, but that doesn't mean that uh, we were going uh, completely with everything because we were going to a secu supposedly secure location where we could be resupplied and receive water and food uh, and other items like that. But we had to get all of our people uh, deployed in short notice. Yeah. Now, how were you wounded this time? The, the second time was, uh, was at Fire Support Base Birmingham off of Highway 547 Alpha, just east of the Ashaw Valley. Okay. And uh, at that time, I was again the brigade or the battalion fire support officer to the first of the three two seventh infantry, and uh, I was we were on a fire support base that began to be attacked by a mortar, and because I was the fire support officer and able to adjust artillery fire uh, myself, I uh, uh, grabbed a radio and got out of the talk and. Uh, was laying down on the ground and two 82 millimeter mortar rounds landed eight feet away from me and peppered me with about 40 to 45 uh, pieces of shell fragment uh, that uh, that uh, caused me some difficulty. Mm -hmm. That one I would imagine you were evac'd out. I was taken out, yes, at that time and uh, uh, went to the brigade uh, or the battalion clearing station and the brigade clearing station, and uh, they they sewed up the wounds and said, "Don't put on boots for a while because I had both feet were wounded." Uh, and uh, after they scraped most of the fragments out of me, uh, uh, I was just like on light duty for. Uh, a week or two, mm -hmm. but did not have to be evacuated out of the brigade. Oh, I, was, okay. I was still with the brigade. Yeah. So you ended up uh, back out. I, eventually, after after a couple of weeks, I I had to go to the supply room and ask for a size ten and a half boot for my left foot and a size twelve boot for my right foot because that still had a bandage and it still had wire stitches on it in it now um, you came you, what what did you do when you when you came home uh, have you had uh, I would imagine you're still having some uh, residuals from uh, your wounds and so forth and well eventually uh, w when I returned from uh, from Vietnam I uh, I decided that uh, this was an okay life I would I would uh, continue to uh, continue to be a career soldier mm -hmm. And uh, I, I knew I still had some fragments in my right arm, my right forearm. And it was in Germany in 19, I think in 1979, that uh, we decided that, that we we're going to have Panorex x uh, rays of everybody's mouth to identify uh, 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 casualties. And the x ray, the Panorex x ray, showed a small white fragment. Uh, in the bottom of my lower jaw, and the dentist said, well, uh, let me take a look at that. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know, but uh, there was a, another piece of metal that was still in there, and he was very eager to take it out, and so I allowed him to do so. Yeah. Well, listen, one of the reasons why we, you were here tonight was to talk about the uh, Military Order of the Purple Heart, uh, the organization itself, the history of it, and so forth. And I'd like you to take uh, some time and tell us uh, a little bit about the history of the Military Order of the Purple Heart. Most people just call it the Purple Heart, but, I, but the real is the uh, Military Order of the Purple Heart was the correct way to say it. And yes, well, the Military Order of the Purple Heart of the U.S. Army of the United States of America is a national veteran service organization exclusively for combat wounded veterans who have been awarded the Purple Heart Medal. Now, you notice I said awarded. We don't earn the medal. It is... It is awarded because it's, it's, it's for certain conditions. Now, the mission of the Military Order of the Purple Heart is to foster an environment of goodwill and camaraderie among combat wounded veterans, promote patriotism, support necessary legislative initiatives, and most importantly, to provide service to all veterans and their families. 
Now, I just want to say definitively here that we are not in any way affiliated with the Wounded Warrior Project. We are a separate national organization. Uh, organizationally, we have in the country, we have six regions that are divided into state departments. Now, North Carolina has, uh, the Department of North Carolina has 12 chapters. Uh, our chapter, 637, comprises 12 counties in the Triangle area and uh, runs north up to the Virginia border. Uh, annually, we have a national convention, and, and it's, as it happens, it's going to occur in two weeks in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, the organization publishes a magazine for veterans every two months, and one of the things that we're a little bit unusual or different from other veterans organizations is we have a one-time fee to join the membership and receive a life membership for a $50 fee. Most of the ch members of our chapter are Vietnam veterans. We have about 120 uh, some members. Most are Vietnam veterans, but we do have World War II, Korea, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Desert Storm. Uh, we even have a female member and uh, another former member of your uh, uh, cast on the show here is uh, Brigadier General Norman Gaddis, a Vietnam prisoner of war, Air mm -hmm. Force prisoner good, of good war. Good friend of ours, been on the show many times. Uh, he's in California right at the moment. Great. Visiting his son. That's wonderful. Now, uh, the, one of the initiatives that, that the Department of North Carolina has taken is to seek the designation of the state of North Carolina as a Purple Heart state. Additionally, we have recognized all counties, all 100 counties in North Carolina have been recognized as Purple Heart counties. They, the county commissioners have signed a proclamation and furnished it to us that uh, identif identifies that they are uh, supportive of our organization and our initiatives. Additionally, the only National Football League team that's a Purple Heart team is the Carolina Panthers. And the National Basketball Association has the only Purple Heart basketball team, the Carolina Horn the, the Charlotte Hornets. Additionally, uh, the Concord Motor Speedway is a Purple Heart Speedway. And uh, many cities, towns, and businesses, as well as colleges and individual organizations have declared their support for Purple Heart veterans. And so we think that North Carolina is a very Purple Heart friendly state, and uh, we're proud to be part of that. August 7th is, is a special date for y'all. That's correct. August 7th is the is National Purple Heart Day. And uh, you're going to hear a little bit more about that with your next guest. But uh, the Purple Heart Day is uh, was designated August 7th because that's the anniversary of the date in 1732 when George Washington created the first Purple Heart, the order of military merit that uh, you're going to be able to hear a little bit more about later in the program. Okay. Um, if someone uh, had a Purple Heart and wanted to get in touch with y'all to become a member or to donate something, how is the best way for them to go about it? Well, they, they should uh, consider contacting us at, uh, at uh, an address that we will provide uh, on the screen, I hope during the break we'll we'll try to figure figure out a way to do that okay and uh, or they can go is there a state uh, purple heart the website well uh, we do we do have one and uh, unfortunately I don't know what that is but it's also possible to contact the purple heart foundation of North Carolina yeah. so that would be purple heart foundation of nc.org okay and we would be able to uh, we would be able to plug you into the appropriate chapter that uh, that services your area. Yeah, we're going to be talking with Jesse in a couple of minutes about uh, a special uh, uh, thing they've uh, the uh, 
foundation has coming up uh, all across the state of North Carolina, and uh, uh, so that would be a way to uh, to bring in some uh, uh, some people who have uh, earned the Purple Heart or been awarded the Purple Heart, excuse me, uh, who have uh, just kind of been out on the on the wayside. You see people all the time. Well, I don't want to join an organization. Uh, I don't want anything to do with Vietnam, and I have found that uh, uh, people who, once they join, uh, it's kind of a healing process to a certain extent. And I would think being around other people who have uh, been awarded the Purple Heart and, and so forth would be somewhat the same. That's absolutely right, and, and that's, that's exactly right. One of the major purposes and accomplishments of veteran service organizations is to create an environment that fosters fellowship among similarly experienced individuals. So if you, if you are fearful of uh, being recognized as a Purple Heart recipient, or if you're embarrassed or ashamed, uh, do not be. Uh, there are plenty of people who uh, would, would be interested to hear your story, and it may be absolutely beneficial for you to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, participate in our organization and certainly the price is right fifty dollars for a lifetime membership and by the way if you are an afghanistan or iraq veteran we will pay your membership because you are a young person still working and needing to support your family and your own livelihood we will support that cost for you and enroll you uh, in one of our chapters and it's well worth it just to uh, get the Purple Heart magazine. It's uh, uh, it's got some great great information and so Is forth. Is it the military order of the Purple Heart? Of the site? USA, yes. That's called PurpleHeart.org. Yeah, Purple Heart Foundation of NC dot org. That's that's our Purple Heart Foundation. Oh, that's that's the chapter. That's the chapter. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so. We're gonna we're gonna uh, give George a switch over. I'm gonna, we have a slight, uh, a short uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation that we pulled off the uh, Purple Heart website. Talks a little bit about it. So we're going to uh, switch over. Thank you. Thank you, George. You're doing good.
Well, we're back live now with uh, another special guest. Uh, I met Jesse some years ago with a mutual friend of ours, uh, Al Meyer, uh, who's actually the uh, gentleman that the, uh, uh, was it 637? Chapter 637, Chapter 637 is named after Al Meyer. Uh, Jesse Torres is one of the, uh, the founding members with Al of the, of the chapter and so forth. Welcome, Jesse. And um, if you are watching the show and you need some motorcycle uh, instructions and so forth, Jesse will be glad to uh, uh, get with you and give you some motorcycle uh, uh, instructions and so forth. And uh, especially how to total one, I guess. It's, uh, exactly. Be, right? And survive uh, it. And survive. Yeah, well, yes. And uh, all right. Uh, Jesse, you are from Texas? I am. What part of Texas? I was born in San Antonio and uh, grew up in a little town called Monday. And it's not between Sunday and Tuesday, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a little town, north central Texas. It's a um, farming community. Uh, at the time that I lived there, about 2,200 people. Uh, last time that I was in Monday was in um, uh, uh, 2013. I went for my 50th class reunion, and um, there was only uh, about 15, 1,600 people left. So um, everybody's graduating, as I did, and moving on out. How many uh, How many of your classmates went to Vietnam, you know? You know, uh, I, was, I was shocked because uh, what happened was that after I graduated and uh, kind of lost touch with a lot of the guys, uh, I, I didn't see them, uh, you know, most went to college. I, I had no, not, it's not that I didn't have aspirations for going to college, but I didn't have the, uh, the, the money to go to college. So the military was going to be my only out out of, uh, Monday. And, uh, I, I grew up as a farmer and I uh, said, no mas, uh, yeah. I did not want to, uh, I did not want to be a farmer. So, um, one day I picked up the phone and called all the, um, recruiters in the area. They came out as I was on this particular field and uh, they they talked to me and um, and I ended up going to the Marines primarily because um, uh, my oldest brother had been a Marine so uh, I kind of followed in the, the family tradition. Well so, I think I think probably Texas had more people going into Marines than any other state It just uh, just looking at some of the uh, history and so forth yeah. working with uh, uh, the Nick Rowe High School down there it seems like almost everybody ended up in the Marines. Yeah probably so we're a little more uh, rough I guess in, in Texas you know and uh, but in any case, I, you know, having gone back in 2013, I found out that a, a lot of my classmates, of course, my graduating class was only 44 people, including myself, so it wasn't that large. But a lot of the guys, uh, in fact, uh, ended up going to, uh, to Vietnam, and I was really shocked, you know. Yeah. Now, uh, you went through basic training or a boot camp, Marine boot camp. I, at, I'm uh, what is called a uh, Hollywood Marine. I went to okay, uh, being went, on the... Being yeah, on no. the Right on the west side of uh, the Mississippi, we go to um, uh, San Diego. So I went through boot camp in San Diego and um, ITR, Infantry Training Regiment, as it was called back then, uh, in Camp Pendleton. And then uh, from there, you go to what is called Station Battalion. And uh, of course, I knew uh, coming out of boot camp uh, uh, that my MOS was um, 0311 or uh, Grunt. So I knew I was going to Vietnam. Yeah, the. Um you go out to Rotterdam Airport, out to the um, uh, uh, group out there where, they, uh, where all the veterans go through, and uh, uh, they always call them the Hollywood Marines. That's out, exactly out, right. Out there. Yeah. So you didn't you didn't get to see Camp Lejeune and, and or Paris Island at all. Never did. Uh, well, I should well, say never Lejeune. did. Uh, I did go to Paris Island after after I came back from Vietnam. That was my uh, my duty station. Not what I put in for, but. But that's what I got. Yeah. Were you a drill instructor? Or? No, as a matter of fact, I ended up working in uh, classification. Um, uh, I administered the, the uh, exams to all the recruits that mm -hmm. determined what their MOS was going to be uh, in the military. Most of you remember that within uh, three or four days of being in in, uh, in boot camp, that you had to take this all day test. Uh, you know, started off at uh, five o'clock in the morning until um, uh, usually by one o'clock we finish, and then we bring back those that. Uh, we're going to specialties at foreign language, uh, musical, artists, those kind of things. You surprised me, Jesse. That, that really surprised me. I thought it was done with a dartboard. <laughs> always, in fact, in I fact always, we did. I always thought it was done by an artboard. Let's see. What? Well, okay. <laughs> no, no. Uh, in, in actuality, we uh, there were actually three tests, three uh, major tests that determined what your MOS was going to be. Um, and, uh, you know. Well, everybody, everybody in the Marines is, is, is a infantry guy. That's exactly right. When you go into the Marine Corps, your, your first day, you grunt, then you go to your specialty. 
Uh, unfortunately, in my case, uh, there were 85 guys in my boot camp um, uh, company, or platoon rather, and out of those 85, only two guys ended up in, uh, in, uh, as uh, grunts, 0311s. That was myself and another guy. We were probably, uh, I thought, pretty squared away. You know, I never got in trouble when I was in, in boot camp. And um, we were told that um, uh, the two of us were going to, about, about three or four weeks before graduation, we were told that we were going to um, uh, sea school. And I was told that sea school was a good duty. And uh, I thought, well, okay, everybody was, else was going to um, motor T or, or whatever uh, other uh, fields, but nobody was grunt. However, a week before graduation, they called us up to the duty hunt, hut, and they told us uh, that um, uh, those two billets had been uh, filled already. Uh, so they put us in the most critical MOS, grunts. Yeah. So. Well, you know, I went to, uh, uh, in the Army, I went to Fort Belvoir engineering school and i think i had more marines in my class than i had army it surprised me yeah. uh there and uh, a lot of people don't know but uh, uh some people were drafted in the marines uh, i was at the uh, induction center here in raleigh <laughs> and the drill instructor came in and said i'm short my quota i'll take you you and you and those guys became marines right there on the spot and that was i think it was somewhat of a surprise to them yeah it, it was a surprise <laughs> and quite honestly a shock you know because um uh, I, I didn't think that the quality of the recruits that we were getting as, as draftees um, uh, w w was as good as the guys that had volunteered to uh, yeah. to serve as a Marine. Yeah, different different mind, mindset too. Exactly. Uh, when did you arrive in Vietnam? I um, let me tell you that I went into um, uh, into the service uh, uh, July sixth of uh, nineteen sixty five, and um, I went through boot camp and ITR and staging and. Um, I flew in into uh, Da Nang on January the 11th, 1966. So um, uh, uh, approximately six months mm -hmm. afterward. Yeah. Okay, you were at Da Nang and you didn't stay there very long. I no, know. as a matter of fact, as soon as I got there, um, uh, trucks came by, picked us up, and uh, they called out names and called out my name and said, you're in 3rd Battalion, 3rd uh, Marine Division. So, um, so they took me to uh, Division Headquarters and then to Battalion Headquarters. And... Um, and from battalion headquarters, they said, you know, get out there uh, on the uh, helo pad. Uh, you're gonna, you're gonna, you know, join the next helicopter and uh, go out to your to your company. And uh, they were lo located south of Da Nang on Hill 22. So um, I got a helicopter. My first helicopter ride to uh, uh, into Vietnam was uh, was from uh, uh, battalion headquarters. Yeah, I think I hear it now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know. In the Army, we got to Vietnam basically dressed in uh, uh, regular, just a regular uh, uh, uniform and so forth. Didn't get weapons or anything for a long time. Uh, did they, would y'all go uh, with already ready? Or did you assign you equipment no, when you I, got there? No, you know, uh, Marines, unfortunately, we always got the, um, we were the last to, to receive, you know, uh, up-to-date up uh, equipment. Mm -hmm. Whatever the Army discarded, that's what the Marines got, so... Our utilities, as we called them, uh, fatigues, I yeah. think the Army called them, our utilities were were really not the, the proper uh, uniform to, to have because they got wet, you know, they were thick, they were heavy, yeah. um, and it took a long time. We, we still had the, the combat boots from um, uh, from uh, uh, ITR, you know, for infantry training regiment. Yeah. Uh, we were using, uh, you know, the leather boots, and, of course, that were not really good uh, for, um, uh, for, oh, the, oh, the, uh, for the yeah. weather that we had in, in – uh, uh, yeah. In Vietnam. Now, did you did, did had they issued y'all the M16s by then? No, or? we we had the M14, and um, I had seen the M14 before, and really liked that uh, that weapon. And um, and what I really like about it, after having been in Vietnam for a while, was the fact that um, uh, that thing could get muddy, um, drop it in mud, you know, uh, and, and pick it up, and it would shoot. It was it was n no problems with um, with jamming or or hang ups or anything. Well, the only problem I saw with it, because of its length, sometimes you were in thick jungle, it was hard to get it up. Well, uh, unfortunately, that is that is one of the problems. Or, but after, you know, when we first got the M16 and the problems that we had with it, with yeah. the M16, that uh, everybody wanted, wished that they had back to the 14. The, back, the, uh, back to the M14. It was heavy, but it was, uh, it it, was, you, it was very you could good. actually yeah. aim it and, and, exactly. and do something with yeah. it, yeah. Um, so you were, was that a, a base camp or... 
uh, was it? Uh, it, it was a, a company-sized base camp. Uh, from from that hill, we ran uh, patrols and bushes, and on occasion, we would do a, a company um, search and destroy sweeps operations. Uh, did y'all live in tents, or did you live in uh, uh, um, sandbag uh, bunkers? Yeah, we did the uh, sandbag bunkers with a uh, soft top with a tent on top of the of the bunker, uh-huh. and uh, you dug a little trench to a fighting hole. So it was the, the the sleeping area was was behind the um, the, uh, the the foxhole. Mm-hmm. Well, it was a little cooler up there too than it was down around Saigon. It's uh, uh, hot during the day and it cools off pretty good at night. It, it did. Um, actually, it you know since I was there for quite quite some time, um, uh, you get during the monsoon when it just rains and rains and rains and you stay you stay wet all the time. Um, yeah. uh, you know you get a little wind and you you know in, in, at night it gets a little chilly. Now, what did you do for food? Sea rats. Nothing All, but. Nothing uh, but sea rats. Nothing but sea rats. Um, did you uh, uh, develop a liking for ham and lamas? <laughs> uh, not if I was. Uh, I had access to the box first. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we always found that the sergeant would take the case and turn it upside down, so you. That's reach exactly in there right. They and did, got that. and you had to deal with what you got. <laughs> that you did. And, uh, I have talked to people who claim they like ham and limes, yeah. but I think there's something else wrong with them, too. So. Well, I'll tell you what. There were times when you would take your plastic fork and just flip the uh, the grease out and, uh, and and eat it cold, you know, if you didn't have a chance to, to eat it. Yeah. You'd be, uh, you know, walking down the trail and just pop it open with your um, P38, I believe it is. Yeah. And uh, pop it open and, um, uh, you know, get rid of the grease and, and chow down. So. What was an average day for you uh, over, uh, out there? Uh, Actually, would you patrol yeah. pretty much every day? Um, no. Uh, the way it operated, uh, uh, we had our platoon was separated from the uh, rest of the company after a while. We went to um, uh, a half a half moon uh, position uh, next to a river, uh, not far from Hill 22, and uh, another company uh, that other platoon had the other half of the uh, of the perimeter, and we just kind of watched the uh, the river for. You know, side pans or anybody that was coming down the river to, um, you know, we search them, stop them, search them, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. During the day and at night, we wouldn't allow anybody to go through. But we we had security around that position uh, during the day. Uh, one um, one squad would be dispersed uh, around uh, that that uh, uh, position, and one squad would be on a day patrol. Then at night, um, the squad that was uh, doing the perimeter watch. Uh, they would then uh, go out on an ambush that night. So, uh, and then you'd have two squads back uh, doing the perimeter at night. So, it was um, it was tough because uh, you weren't getting a whole lot of sleep. And uh, it was you know I'm not going to tell you how many times standing up I, I ended up falling asleep you know and and it wasn't for the fact that I heard a footstep or something like that you know somebody coughed that you know yeah. bring you back up, but we were really hurting for um, uh, for sleep. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, an ambush. Uh, when it got dark, it got dark, didn't it? It really did. Um, and, and, of course, um, you didn't really want to go out on the ambush when, uh, full, when the moon was full uh, for, for the specific reason that you could, they could see you as well as you could see them. But, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was nice and dark. And um, you'd, most of the time, you know, we'd pull uh, uh, an ambush around a trail or a, uh, two trails that intersect or something of that nature. Yeah, but the jungles have a tendency to be real noisy, didn't they? With that they are. Uh, for some reason, they, I don't know whether they were high on grass or whatever, but uh, they, they, never, they didn't follow um, proper military procedure, you know, uh, being quiet and moving along or whatever. They'd be laughing and talking and, you know, just carrying on, and, and uh, that, was, that was good for us. Yeah. Uh, Do you have any uh, conversation with wildlife? <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm not going to tell you how many water buffaloes were killed. Uh, yeah, at night, uh, water buffalo would get get out from the um, the farmer's uh, uh, little hooch, and uh, and he'd be trampling out there in the middle of the night. And we we hear this um, uh, what we would think would be an army of uh, you know gooks you know coming at us, and and, uh, and we'd open up and ended up uh, uh, you know really cutting up uh, pretty badly uh, uh, the farmer's water buffalo, yeah. which we had to uh, then uh, pay for. Pay for. Yeah. Well, did you get to uh, cook a bar- have a barbecue after that? No, we we didn't do anything with the meat. <laughs> Uh, from what I understand, it was pretty tough. Well, I, I never ate any water buffalo, thank yeah. heaven. You know, I never. I had plenty of sea rats. Well, what did you do for uh, a shower or bath? You know, that was one of the problems that um, that we had. Even though we were close to the river, we couldn't get to the river. 
other than to um, to walk down this um, uh, embankment to to get to the um, uh, uh, to the side pants mm -hmm. when we pulled them over. But um, on occasion, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd uh, get into the river. Most of the time, wherever we came across a stream or whatever, it was it was fairly deep. We'd actually take five minutes to take a five minute break and just just sit in it, and uh, and that was the extent of our bath. Yeah. Um, now the guys back at Hill Twenty Two did in fact have a, um, a huge tank uh, full of water that uh, they could take um, a soap bath or shower. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you could go. How long would you actually go out on patrol without without any way oh, of taking I, a bath? I, I tell you what, we we had to. We were rank. Um, we we'd go maybe um, a month, month and a half, you know, without having taken a shower. Yeah. Now, folks, you, if, as you're out there watching, if you have uh, uh, not a veteran, uh, how would you like to go uh, out? And it's uh, humidity is probably uh, I don't know if such a thing as humidity being 200 percent, but I believe it feels it feels like it sometimes during the monsoon seasons, mm -hmm. and and then about a hundred degree temperature, and you're out there uh, with all everything you've got on your back and and so forth, sweating in the dirt, and think about going for a month without a, um, without a bath or being able to wash <laughs> off. And the thing about it was, if you were out someplace and a buddy got wounded, you may end up with uh, uh, his blood and, and other parts all <laughs> over you, and there's no way to change. That's exactly right. Yeah, and, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't tell you that when I, when I joined my, uh, my company there on Hill 22, I was sent to, um, to um, uh, the supply tent to get my uh, my gear, and I was given a cartridge belt, a uh, flax jacket, uh, my rifle, uh, you know, ammo and everything else, and um, grenades and what have you. The the um, the flax jacket had a guy's name Snyder and um, no Schroeder, I'm sorry, Schroeder, and um, and it was blood all over the uh, the flax jacket as well as the, uh, the cartridge belt. And I asked the supply sergeant, said, "Who is this guy Schroeder?" He said, "Oh, he was killed." Uh, about three or four days ago. I said, oh, God. And I'm getting his gear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about how you got wounded. Um, March uh, 19th, 1966. We were on the day patrol and uh, from that position close to the river. And uh, uh, we had a, uh, I, you know, we, we everybody, nobody wanted to carry the radio, as you obviously know, yeah. uh, uh, even at a platoon level or a company, I mean, a squad level. And um, it, it turned out that it was my day to carry the radio that particular day. We had a, a procedure that we followed, uh, brevity code as we, we called it. Uh, we had checkpoints on the, uh, on the map coordinates of the, of, of the route that we were to take and uh, that we had gotten you know, just before we left. And uh, there were uh, specific uh, uh, checkpoints that we had to identify. And rather than to say I'm at checkpoint one or checkpoint two, uh, we decided uh, as we, 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 we were leaving what the checkpoint was going to be called, and we decided we could do, do cars, beers, whatever you wanted to. So we decided to do beers. And uh, you get checkpoint one says, I'm drinking my, my first fall step. Checkpoint two, I'm drinking two um, uh, uh, black labels or whatever, you know. Uh, course didn't exist back then. So, uh, so you know, the, the, those are the kind of things we did. So we followed a, um, uh, uh, a specific route. And um, we stopped, uh, I don't know, between checkpoint, whatever they were, and we came across this uh, little pagoda uh, that the, you know, close to a cemetery. And um, there was a, a real pretty banner that was uh, hanging inside the pagoda. And I thought, you know, that'll, that'll make a good um, war souvenir. So I took it down, rolled it up, stuck, stuck it in my jacket, and kept on going. And um, we were in a we were in a, in, in a bunch of trees, and right next to that same river that uh, you know a mile, a couple of miles back, was where our, our platoon position or uh, yeah platoon position was. We came out of the tree line, with the river on one side, and we were walking, um, you know, a squad, and about three quarters of the squad was out when they opened up, and I was I was carrying the radio, so I was a I was the 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 only one hit. And uh, another guy got hit by the time they got they got back to uh, to the tree line. But um, so I heard Corman up, and you know by that time I'm trying to to determine how bad I am, you know. And uh, the only thing I could feel was my leg; it was about to explode. And I thought, what the hell, you know? These guys are trying to kill me. So so I um, uh, I determined that you know worst case scenario I would lose a leg. You know I wouldn't die from from uh, from that um, uh, injury, so or wound. So I. 
you know, my, my handset or my radio was, was laying uh, somewhere and I pulled it up to me and, and uh, I knew that, well, by that time, uh, they'd already heard the, uh, they being Hill 22, mm -hmm. could hear the, uh, the gunfire, the firefight taking place. So um, I talked to the um, company commander at that time and um, told him what had happened. And he wanted to know where I was. And I said, well, I said, we were about um, maybe 100 meters um, uh, south of, uh, uh, at, at, I think I ended up saying checkpoint three. And, um, he, and I said, right next to the river. And he said, um, uh, where's the squad leader? I said, he's, he's uh, behind me in, uh, in a tree line. Can you move? I says, no, I can't. And um, I didn't even try, to be honest with you. I was just sitting there, you know, uh, I, I didn't think that I could move. So um, uh, the corpsman had come, come up. I had heard the, uh, the somebody said corpsman up, but I thought the corpsman went elsewhere. So I was just still laying out there. And um, so I told him uh, uh, where I was. He said, well, I'll tell you what. He says, I'm going to shoot a willoughby around. He says, uh, approximately, uh, you know, how far are they ahead of you? And, um, you know, as a clock, you know, 12, you know, yeah. uh, one, two, three, whatever. So I, I told him approximately. So they shot a uh, Willie Peter round, 81 uh, mortar round, and I uh, saw where it was, and um, I corrected it, and they, and uh, that was it was almost on top. Of them. I said fire for effect, and um, and uh, they they uh, the, the the shooting stopped after the fire for effect. So I told them I said, hey guys, I said I'm I'm hit. I need a, I need a medevac. <laughs> so uh, as it turned out, the other guy that uh, uh, had been hit was uh, uh, I think when he dove or something he. He nicked himself or whatever, but it was a um, uh, a non-threatening uh, wound, so he didn't he didn't get medevac. For those of you who are listening, uh, Willie Pete is a white phosphorus, uh, which is some pretty nasty stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. You can't probably put it out once it gets going. That's exactly right. And uh, and they evacuated you out. And, Absolutely, uh, I got a ride on the on the chopper again, and uh, we flew over the um, the area that we had had the uh, firefight, and um, uh, we were talking to the guys or the or the uh, pilot was talking to the guys uh, at the squad and found out that there was, um, uh, there was uh, quite a few um, uh, bloody bandages. So they probably uh, uh, either took their wounded or and KIA as well with them. Yeah, they, so, used, they usually yeah, did that. Yeah. All right. Well, Jesse, I want to uh, let you talk a little bit about the, um, uh, the Purple Heart Foundation across the state and so forth, okay. uh, specifically uh, the, uh, the Wake Forest one, the dinner that's coming up and yeah. so forth. Well, let me let me clarify some some uh, okay. uh, some some Purple Heart Foundations. The Purple Heart uh, Veteran Organization has the uh, it's called the Military Order of the Purple Heart of the USA, and also we have a Military Order of the Purple Heart Service Foundation, and that belongs to to those two organizations. And then we also have the uh, Purple Heart Foundation of North Carolina. Uh, the Purple Heart Foundation of North Carolina is a, uh, an organization that um, does uh, a, a Purple Heart appreciation dinners for Purple Heart recipients throughout North Carolina. Uh, it started as a, um, as a way for a, a, a local church in Wake Forest, uh, Presbyterian Church in Wake Forest, to honor the, the, um, the, the veterans, the Purple Heart veterans that, uh, that lived there. Uh, there were members, actually, and they got about you know, a handful and then decided to open it up to more people and, and more and more to the point that, that ended up uh, establishing a Purple Heart Foundation and, uh, of North Carolina to do it. And then they decided, with the assistance of a big uh, sponsor, uh, uh, Walmart in this particular case, Walmart was our, our main sponsor and corporate sponsor, and they, um, uh, with their assistance, we started expanding it not only to Wake Forest, but to other cities. And we also did um, Winston-Salem. Uh, uh, we started uh, Charlotte a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, let me see if I can get, name Wilmington, them all. Goldsboro. Uh, Wilmington, yeah, uh, Goldsboro. New, New and, yeah, and, and, and New Bern is, is going to be the first one this okay. year in August. Um, I'll be going to, um, to the one in, um, I won't make Wake Forest, which is my, my home uh, um, a Purple Heart dinner, but I'm going to... Um, uh, because I also serve on the board of the, uh, the Purple Heart Foundation. Um, I'm going to the one in uh, Goldsboro and also the one in New Bern. Uh, now, the North Carolina Foundation, uh, uh, North Carolina Purple Heart Foundation, uh, when we establish a uh, city, uh, we, get all, we get the community, the leaders in the community, as well as the uh, veteran service organizations involved in creating a, um, a group of people, a committee, 
to, to do this. And once that committee gets established, uh, then we we um, we do uh, we get them to uh, to do a um, to set themselves up as a 501c3 so that they can then solicit uh, contributions from um, uh, from other companies and local companies and so forth to keep this going um, either every year or every other year or whatever they they wish to do. So um, uh, it's it's a, a the, the, the most important part of the dinner is not just the food but it's called uh, the walk of honor where the uh, Purple Heart recipient is called by name and he walks uh, under the uh, sabers of a or OTC unit, uh, JROTC unit. And um, it's, a, it's a very moving uh, deal because they put your name up on the, on the wall, um, on a graphic, and uh, your, your name's out there with um, what branch of service, uh, when you were wounded. And, um, uh, and, and it's very, very nice because you get the recognition that obviously we as, as a as uh, Vietnam vets never received. And it's a very, very nice way for the community to thank at least the Purple Heart veterans. And it's free for the uh, Purple Heart recipient. Uh, for the Purple Heart recipient, and he can bring up the three members to each um, dinner. And uh, there, too, are, are provided a free ticket. Now, what if uh, what kind of sponsoring are available? If someone wanted to uh, sponsor uh, some Purple Hearts uh, for the dinner, or have a table, or uh, absolutely, they can they can buy tickets uh, and say, um, I want to give these tickets to veterans, or or they can buy a table uh, if they go to the website, uh, North Carolina Purple Heart, uh, uh, Purple Heart Foundation of North Carolina uh, dot org. If they go to that um, um, uh, 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 to that website, they can see that there's um, a sp there's sponsorship levels. Red is a hundred dollars, white is two fifty. And, and they get different benefits with each one of them, blue, 500, um, and, um, and Premier is over over $1,000. I believe so, uh, an individual ticket, if someone wanted to attend, was $20? <laughs> well, we'll take, we'll take any donation. The, the amount is, in, uh, is not, uh, not important. If you want to donate, whatever it is that you donate, it can pay for, um, for the gift that we give to the Port Heart recipient. It can pay for, for, uh, for something else. So... Um, yeah, well, the one in Wake Forest, I believe, is August sixth. Uh, is it is August sixth, and which is also the yeah. day that the military or Purple Heart is doing the uh, POWMI mate ceremony at the state capitol. That is correct. So, calling uh, of the names and yeah, so forth. That's exactly now, right. Now it's at the um, uh, Richland uh, Clark Community Church on uh, on Burlington Mills Road in Wake Forest. Correct. Uh, that's that one. Uh, do we have an address or anything for some of the uh, others? They, or, they need or to go get off the website. Yeah they, yeah, they need to go to the website to get it because uh, um, each each uh, city has a different um, uh, contact information. Mm -hmm. um, and and we, we tell you the names of, or the, the cities that the, the dinners are being held at. So you need to go to um, um, uh, to these um, to, to, to the foundation page and see which city they're in and so forth. Yeah. So, um, yeah, a mutual friend of ours was, uh, uh, Bob Cox was, uh, I know he was always excited every year to uh, attend the dinner uh, and so forth. He uh, always talked about it long before and, and, long, and long afterwards. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, it was very, very special to him uh, before we lost him. And uh, you want to say anything else about uh, the dinner or the foundation or the Purple Heart uh, organization altogether? Uh, George told us a lot a bit about how, how strong it is in the state. And uh, by the way, if you're in the Raleigh area and you'd like to come down and uh, and, and take part in the uh, calling of the names of the 39 from North Carolina who's still missing on August 6th, uh, come down. It starts at 12 o'clock noon, and uh, I believe Jesse's going to be out of town at another mm -hmm. function. Uh, George, you going to be there? No, but uh, our senior vice commander okay. will... Uh, We'll do that. Ross Fowler. Oh, yep. okay. So Ross will be there. Uh, I'll be there. Uh, we'll, we'll have so some, some we'll I have uh, a good representation there as always. Uh, if you do have a chance to uh, uh, go online and uh, make a donation to, uh, to reach out to some uh, PO, mm -hmm. uh, some uh, recipients of the Purple Heart that you know and invite them to the dinner, uh, bring them yourself if you have to. Go by and pick them up, put them in the car, and tell them you're going to buy their dinner. And then, and then yeah. take them over to wherever. And if you're not going to the one in Wake Forest, be sure and go online, some of the other locations. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a very special event, and it would be nice if you uh, know someone who had received the Purple Heart but is just not quite of, 
uh, just kind of kept it quiet for a while. That would be a good opportunity to show them how much you honor uh, their service and uh, uh, what they did for our country is to uh, tell them you're going to take them to dinner and, and take them to one of these dinners. Or if you just want to make a, a donation or gift in, in, in honor of them uh, and uh, their honor, uh, you can do that. Just go on the website. You'll get the addresses and so forth, or who to contact. If you'd like to be involved in some way as a volunteer, I mean, it takes a lot to put one of these things together. I mean, the food, the location, mm-hmm. tables. Uh, it's amazing uh, all the things that have to be done. Uh, go online and, and volunteer for the one that's in your particular area. I know they'll find something for you to do uh, there. And, De- uh, depending on the city, uh, the attendance could be anywhere from 450 to 800 people. So this is not a, um, a small event. It's a, it's a, it's a big event. Uh, yeah that is well supported by the communities in, in these cities. Yes. Uh, looking forward to uh, seeing you and uh, call in sometime and tell us if, uh, about the dinner you go to, if you go, or who you are able to sponsor. Give us some feedback and, and so forth uh, on some of our other shows. Uh, our next show will be in uh, is about three weeks now, because this is the end of the month. What's the August of somebody? August 10th will be our next show. Uh, Be sure and tune in, and thank you for tuning in tonight. We've enjoyed bringing you all this information, and I hope you can take it and and run with it and uh, support the uh, Military Order of Purple Heart and the uh, Foundation uh, of Purple Heart organizations out there. They need you, and uh, you need some of them also. So, again, thank you for tuning in tonight, and uh, looking forward to uh, seeing you next show. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Omnon Nissan, My Life, My Will with Gisela DiCarlo, The Tanya Love Show, Help Then with Debbie Brook, Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Triangle Be Well with Howard Jacobson, Lunch and Learn with Rabbi Yisrael Cutler, Lessons of Vietnam with NCVVI members, Current Affairs with Omnon Nissan, And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section on nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Atomos.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters, CarolinaApparel.com, and DeltaForce.net.